Yo, Inception is fire. Can, can you listen to what Jack's saying? It, it's, <laughs> it's just fire in general. All he all happened in Memento already. Mm, 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 that's that's what I love cinema for. Like I know I'm gonna lose. We could just we could just I get it. <laughs> Hello, my name's Jack Howard and welcome to The Screen Test. Look, I need no excuse to talk about Christopher Nolan films, but Dunkirk has just come out on Prime Video and you've got Inception on there as well. But out of all of his films, I I just, I don't know which one's best. And luckily, I've got the power to make my friends talk to me about it on a podcast. And we're joined as always by the chief film critic at The Independent, Clarice Lockery. Hello. One third of the cyber nerds, Joe Akimwin. What's good? And this week we're joined by filmmaker and author Hazel Hayes, who has written a book called Out of Love, which is told in reverse. So you're probably going to have a lot of opinions on the way that time is used in Nolan's storytelling. I'll have a couple of things to say, yeah. I mean, so what is it that you've that you've brought to the table, Hazel? You're the guest, so go go first. Obviously, I have gone for a memento. I am a sucker for a backwards narrative, and this is a fully fractured, totally reverse, actually slightly forwards, backwards, Tenet-ish narrative uh, a long time before Tenet. And it's got some extra psychological shit thrown in there. It's it's about philosophy. It's about psychology. It's, yeah, it's my bag. It's my jam. I'm sorry. Okay, so we've got Memento. Joe, what have you brought? I mean, I'll be talking about Christopher Nolan's best movie ever. <laughs> so Memento a, as well then. Which is a dream within a dream within a dream. Inception. Obviously. Okay, so we've got beginning of the career, middle of the career, and now Clarice... Yeah, I have weird opinions about Christopher Nolan, <laughs> so I know everyone's just going to get mad at me because I I have spent most of his career like not really gelling with this film. Like I think he's a, a great filmmaker, but I've never been like, oh my God, Christopher Nolan, until Dunkirk and Tenet, which are just two films I have randomly gone wild for. <laughs> so, so what is it about, so you, you've picked Tenet, I picked Ted out, yeah. Which I appreciate. And I don't know if if you're listening to this on a podcast, you're missing out on some visual magic, but also people who are watching. Look at my look at my t shirt. It's a, so a Tenet t shirt, but it's also like a Spider Man Spider Man reference. It's your best one. It's my best one. Okay, so that means we've got Memento versus Inception versus Tenet, the beginning of his career, the middle of his career, and where we're at present day with his career, which I think is an exciting um, choice for, for talking about Christopher Nolan's films. So here's how this is going to work. We're going to put those films through a series of rounds, including cast, memorable scene, and cultural impact, all the usual ones. And then based on your arguments, I get to decide which one is best. You're going to have to convince me why your choice is the best one. Why me? Well, I'll tell you at the end, which is actually the beginning. <laughs> Little Nolan joke there for the fans. Only they'll get that. You have oh to watch God. Rick and Morty to get that sort of humour. So let's go ahead and kick it off with where we seem to be heading, which is about the memorable scenes in Christopher Nolan's films. And let's go to Tenet first. I think that, I mean, the plane scene is spectacular, but I think the scene that really hooked me onto this film was watching the protagonist fight himself. Because yeah. it's one of the most... I think the second version is better. Yeah, I, I think both. Well, I think it helps having the reveal mm -hmm. and and seeing the way that it's been reverse engineered is like, I don't even know, I can't process how they actually pulled that off yeah i watched the behind the scenes of it and I, it was super legit like they just choreographed like one of them is legitimately fighting backwards and yep. he's fighting for like it's actually okay. when you watch it it's like it's actually mind-blowing i thought it was super super yeah. legit when they did it but one of the things about tenon i feel like is maybe it was just me but i did feel like it was predictable that before they got to the reveal of him fighting himself that i kind of knew it was him i think he kind of knows fighting. that I, yeah. I, I think for some people it might play as a twist, but I think ultimately we kind of, I think that's kind of what's nice about it is that there are some really confusing, complicated things to get hold of, but at the center of it, it's like, okay, so he's going to end up fighting himself on the way back. Like, I think yeah. you can at least grasp onto something like that and that makes it a little bit more accessible. Yeah, it's just like Bill and Ted, really. It's a yeah. lot like Bill and Ted. I think I love Tenet so much because it's the slightly more experimental Christopher Nolan movie. Mm -hmm. Like he's just pushed things a little bit further and it's a little bit weirder and a little bit more out there. And like, and I don't get why people would be upset about that. Like some people have said like, it's weird that he's making essentially a huge experimental arts film, but on a blockbuster budget. And I'm like, fuck yes he is. Yes, like, please. Absolutely, I would like, like this. try that sort of <laughs> stuff because you're at the top of your game. 
this is the time to be like, this might not be perfect. And I think he knows that as well. Like it might not be perfect. It might not all work, but I'm going for it in a way that other directors can't. Like nobody else could have got this made and took these chances. <laughs> Joe, what is it? You, you said that your memorable scene was going to be the hallway scene. Yeah, mine was the hallway scene. I just feel like everything they did for that scene was amazing. Obviously with the whole practical effects, actually building it. Having the behind the scenes footage of that in, oh. in zero gravity, um, fighting, being the only one who's awake in that scenario, and having to like kind of shepherd everyone through the next kick to get out of the dream, I felt like was just uh, uh, amazing, just on an action level. Um, and I just, I just love the scene. I feel like it's like it doesn't, un it doesn't disappoint. Like, yeah, like when you when you I saw that bit in the trailer where it with the hallway starts spinning. to spin and I was like, well, I can't wait to see that in full. Yeah. And it is just incredible. It's perfect. That yeah, bit. and it's and it's a tense moment in the movie as well. And I feel like they get all of these things in because obviously he's in a race against time, while on another level they're in a race against time. And it just you just get everything in that scene, and I just I just love it. And it's just turning the world on his head. Mm -hmm. Hazel, what is your? So I'm just nodding along. I'm like, I love <laughs> Do you, do you the visual of humans floating and tied together it's just yeah. it, it's so iconic yeah yeah it's, it's and, and and i think joseph gordon levitt as well like committing to that yeah. moment and you can clearly tell it took a lot of training well, it definitely took a lot of training um and also the dedication as well like this is something that Nolan is obviously very famous for now but really doing stuff in a movie rather than yeah. just going, we can do this with CGI. And mm -hmm. obviously we're not talking about Interstellar, which I'm, I'm not a big fan of anyway, but the fact that they didn't use any green screens in that and it's all like projections and with this practically doing mm -hmm. something like a spinning hallway. I also like that Inception, like all of Nolan's films, can be read as well as like a cinematic experience in terms of the fact that dreams feel like movies and the way that he explains how dreams work is the way that movies work when he says, you don't really remember the beginning of a dream. You always wind up in the middle of it. Yep. That's exactly how we feel yeah. when we're watching the movie. So when it cuts to that scene, when he's explaining that to Elliot Page about how dreams work and that you wind up in the middle of it, that you also wind up in the middle of scenes and you as an audience don't question how you got to the middle of that scene. And so he's pointing that out to you as well as the character yeah, as well. Inception is fire. Can you listen to what Jack's saying? It's just, <laughs> it's just fire in general. What I love about Memento is that he doesn't need all the traps and trimmings of sci-fi to get to that deeper psychological question that, okay, yes, we're dealing with uh, a mental condition uh, where he can't form short-term memory. So there's a bit there's a bit of a gimmick. And of course, we're we're telling the story in a fractured way. So cinematically, we've got a bit of a gimmick, but neither are really gimmicks. And it doesn't require a lot of explaining. Like all we have is him meeting the hotel clerk and going, I got a condition. I can't make new memories. Done. Well, he sets, done. Up, he sets it up beautifully just in the opening sequence by having the, you know, the bullet go back into the gun and the undeveloping photograph. Like exactly, he just which, tells you this will, is going backwards. Which will bring me on to my next point, which is all he all shit happened in Memento already. He introduced inversion. He introduced the premise of going backwards through time. He even introduced Inception yeah, because the story of Sammy Jenkins and his wife, who ultimately sadly dies because he keeps giving her her insulin injection, she's sort of testing him, is because he planted Leonard in his, well, in his story, planted the seed that well, her husband Hazel, was he, It's even his, deeper because it's not even... Because it's not even him, not even on him. the surface level. So he incepted himself. He incepted himself, <laughs> yeah. But, but somebody planted the idea that the husband was faking it. And so in order to test him, uh, she basically puts him through these tests that ends up sadly killing her, which turns out to be his story and not Sammy. But the idea of inception was there. The idea of inversion was there. And what scenes do you think stand out in Memento for you? The scene that really gets me emotionally is um, with uh, Natalie, played by Carrie Ann Moss, where, and her whole relationship to him is so warped and so strange, but the scene where she uses his memory loss against him to get him angry enough with her, like baiting him and baiting him till he hits her, and then hides all the pens, leaves the house and sits in her car watching them. And I'm, I'm breaking up. These are kind of separate scenes because they're broken up well, in, in terms of- You're a, right though, but in terms of the structure of it. In terms of the structure as a scene, she sits in the car watching him 
desperately trying to find a pen to write down you can't trust her she's she's lying to you and then gives it enough time that he forgets she walks back in the door and goes some other guy hit me you have to help me you have to help me and they end up sleeping together and it's like it's so and he ended disturbing. we find out that he ended up killing her boyfriend or at least we think kind of by think mistake were, yeah yeah and now she's trying to set him up and use it against him and 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 yeah it's it's just it's gut wrenching and it's mm-hmm. the tension is so real, but it's about. I hate the scene when she spits in the glass. Oh, the scene where she spits in the glass. Off. But again, it. right, you're talking about just this classic neo noir thing where the entire film is anxiety, it's tension. And it's not because the world is ending, it's not because there's an army at the door. She's spat in his drink and it's gross and we don't want him to drink it. He can't find a pen to write down that she's, you know, betraying him. And it's so simple and i think that's what the simplicity is what always gets me i want to bring in inception a bit more before we move on from the memorable scenes because we haven't spoken enough about the some of the stuff that happens in that movie because obviously we've got the spinning hallway but also you've got the folding city and then you've also got the wonderful emotional scenes between robert fisher and his father which is amazing as well because inception isn't really about the heist it's basically in a way i like, know a celebration of how films are made filmmakers putting on a show to give someone a cathartic emotional experience yeah, yeah to yeah. change their life <laughs> definitely i mean and i just i love that theme i mean the father and son theme of the whole movie where it's just like this is just about a son feeling like his dad just doesn't love him do you know what i'm saying and 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 we're going through all of these dream levels and these missions just just to to nail home like just to change someone's emotion that they had that or something that they've been carrying around since they was a youth. Do you know what I'm saying? And I, I feel like they just, they do it so legitly. And I just love that scene where um, in the end they get into the safe and it's just him, um, it's him and his dad and he opens up the safe and it's, the, um, the windmill thing. Oh, it's the, the windmill, windmill thing. Yeah. yeah, like I like that. That moment touched me yeah. so deeply because I was just like, Raw, Killian like, Murphy. Yeah, Killian Ooh. Murphy. He, he murders that. He that murders scene. that. It needed him to be that vulnerable yeah. in it because you you imagine because he's he's got very little sort of you get to know him, but he's yeah, got very little time, time yeah. to get that across, and he really like the moment when he grabs his dad's hand and just like bows his head onto it as he's crying is just it, it's, uh, uh, incredible. Yeah, it's, it's, it's deeply emotional a scene for a movie that is, do you know what I'm saying? Hallway spinning, mm-hmm. skiing, it's things all grounded blowing up in, and all of that. Do you know what I'm saying? I feel real. like, yeah, they still, they still nailed that home. But obviously the most memorable scene of Inception, the ending, the spinning top. I mean, what do you what guys do we think? think? Oh, I, I, my opinion is it doesn't matter. I That's mean, my, it, I, I know that might seem a bit like a coward's way out. It, it just doesn't seem like it, he could, there's no happy ending for him. I don't believe, do you know what I'm saying? Like he's already lost everything. Like, and just getting back to his kids, I just, I just don't think, I don't think they it's are real. the same age as it's well. Yeah, I don't, I just true. don't, yeah, I don't think it's real for they're him. They're slightly older, they're slightly older. Ever so slightly, yeah, yeah they, they, they are. S- different kids. Yeah. It's but interesting. It's a little bit, it is a little bit too good to be true. Isn't I it? remember That's being it. in the cinema though, seeing that movie, having already seen it and being in a full cinema. You remember full cinemas? I was in a full yeah. cinema and just when it cuts to black and just hearing everyone go. <gasps> yeah, there and was an just, audible oh, gasp. Just that's, yeah, 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 yeah. Mm, 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 that's, I, that's what I love cinema I for. I love that about Inception. I, I Look, I, along with all the other things I'm a sucker for, an ambiguous slash dark ending. Love it. Love it. I love it. Why have a happy ending? Right, I'm going to give out some points now. All right. It has to go to Inception top points because holy crap, like everything in it. And then I'm going to go bias. I'm going to give it two points to Tenet um, because I think there's some real big plane reversing fights. I think Memento is wonderful, but has less sort of standout individual moments in it. But I'm going to give you a bonus point, Hazel, because you argued things beautifully and also you helped everybody else out with their arguments as well. I think you just (laughs) argued for Christopher Nolan there. So the points as they stand, Memento and Tenet are on two points each and Inception is in the lead with three. And it feels like we were going on to cast. Um, Let's jump in with Joe and Leonardo DiCaprio. Yeah, I feel like um, Inception's got a a great cast with Leonardo DiCaprio, Ken Ken Wantanabe, (laughs) Joseph Gordon-Levitt, Elliot Page, uh, Marion Cotillard, 
um, Tom Hardy, and I just feel like it's it's just a, it's a great cast that he's put together. And when you've got Leonardo DiCaprio leaving it, I feel like it just elevates everyone's performance. Killian Murphy's in the movie with limited screen time, but you still you like you still feel connected to the character. Um, and I just I feel like everyone just everyone gives a great performance, and it's led by Leonardo DiCaprio's lost like grief ridden like he's all over the place emotionally and obviously that is shown in the movie by him not being able to build to be the architect because obviously his mind is and also the fact that we get to see him go into his mind his collapsed. own dreams yeah. and how he spends his evenings essentially is just well it's just, said in the movie as well like he tells people not to do things that he absolutely does yeah like it's 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 actually mad like just what he's doing in it. And I just feel like he's a great performance. And this is why I really feel like it's one of Nolan's best movies because he went out and got Leonardo DiCaprio to do it. And Leonardo DiCaprio was like, yeah, I'll do this. I don't think he would have been involved in a movie that didn't give him room to stretch his legs the way that Inception does. Yeah, and I think it's nice to see, like for example, a scene after the big opening sequence where he's in the hotel room and he spins the, um, the totem for the first time. And it's just a phone call with his children it's just making and sure you just have this extended right, yeah. scene where it's pretty expositional and actually that's the thing that is is in all the the moments with how good dicaprio is in this in that scene where he's basically saying i can't come home because this is just expositional but the way he, how emotional he is and then that's the same with the scene with michael kane as well is i can't go home because this here's my only way home i think i found it like that's all the dialogue is but the way that he's delivering it it it, it every line of it is is a different emotion from him like there's regret and like you say there's guilt and grief and all these different things that are coming up with very expositional lines but DiCaprio is so good he's and so he good. has a lot of exposition even with the scenes with Elliot Page as well I mean I used to joke that that whole character was just there to go why Absol <laughs> so, well, absolutely that is and what, sure they are but that is yeah. what they are there for um but yeah, I think he handles the exposition really, really well, given he so much of his dialogue is just explaining the mechanics of the and, dream and world. And all the other surrounding characters like Tom Hardy and Joseph Gordon-Levitt and people like, could come across as like chess pieces, mm -hmm. but they all interject so much personality into their own... Like, I love watching Tom Hardy in that movie. He's such a little cheeky... When he like, gets the gu big gun out, he's yeah. like, don't be afraid to dream a little bigger, darling. Yeah, and <laughs> even just like knock it, Like, I love their little love-hate marriage sort of old married couple bickering with each other just gone levitt and tom hardy the way he like kicks the chair and he's like yeah. this ariadne is a kick and it <laughs> makes him jump and they, they've just there's just so much chemistry between them even though they've got such li little mm. like they're very one note characters but there's nothing wrong with that because the movie's not about them and also marianne marianne cotillard is just so stunning in that role yeah, she's that, amazing yeah i mean she brings so much emotion to ultimately the villain, the antagonist of and the piece. And also she's not real. And the she's entire not time real, she's but never she, real. She, yeah, yeah, but her interactions with with um, Cobb and even when JGL sees her at the beginning, I was like, you know, what's she doing here? You sense that that past between them. Um, yeah, no, I think she's really good. And I'm very... fighting for someone else's film again. <laughs> I have to stop doing it. I was about to say, what about, uh, Clarice, were you going to say something about Inception? No, I was just going to say she's very film noir as well. I think that... I, the way that he manages to make that, I know the dead wife thing just crops up so much, but I think the way that he manages to make that character interesting, at least, is to play off all the film noir tropes, like the slinkiness and the way she's sort of mysterious and French. <laughs> shadowy and like there is something like quite sinister about her, even in her moments of like, true vulnerability where right at the end where she's kind of grabbing the knife and saying like, I don't, please don't go. It's like, I, you spend the whole time going, I do, I want to trust uh, this yeah, woman. Yeah, I'm almost with it. Like I, there's definitely pity and uh, sympathy and, and also you're so angry and frustrated with her, but yeah, there's the, it's, it's complicated. And I think that's what's interesting about his femme fatales. And, and the same is true of Natalie, uh, who's played by Carrie Ann Moss in Memento. She is one of the most interesting female characters, I think, in cinema. Like watch, watching her back again recently, I'm just fascinated by it. She flips on a dime between seeming to truly want to help Leonard 
and just being the most horrible, brutal, cruel manipulative. person, manipulative, horrible toward like to use someone's mental condition against them like that truly is kind of the lowest of the low. Um, but Teddy's doing that as well. Teddy is doing it in a For money. slightly different way, but he's also he also he's getting him to kill people. He is, but he knows that Leonard's going to do that with or without him, and he's sort of he's sort of allowing him to do it in it, it's a weird thing to say but he's allowing it to do it in a safe framework like he he's kind of protecting Leonard from himself in a way like he knows he's going to go off and just continue to do this with or without and he's giving him a sense of purpose in life as well but no you shouldn't don't, well, don't I, kill I, people kids also as well I think except actually for Tenet all of the hero most of the heroes that Nolan goes for are sort of morally ambiguous and Tenet is very much like he very intentionally was saying, no, I want a protagonist who is optimistic. And because you're usually in the spy world, you get somebody who's hard done by or somebody who's uh, sort of emotionally, you know, stinted, stunted uh, and, and cold. Mm -hmm. Whereas in this, he makes a point in the beginning to save people he doesn't even need to. Do you know what I mean? Like he, he, he wants to help humanity enough to mm -hmm. say, you know, there's that line that's not our mission. And he says, it's mine now. Like he takes it yeah. upon himself to help people. I'd argue you get that with McConaughey and Interstellar as well. And, and to some degree in Dunkirk. But yeah, you're right. I mean, for a lot, of, a lot of the time, for a lot of his films, you have very morally ambiguous um, protagonists who do very questionable things. I mean, even Leo in, in Inception takes his entire team on a mission without revealing what's actually at stake, that they could all be killed in this scenario that they're not they're not used to the rules being being the way they are let's talk about guy pierce though in memento oh, let's talk about guy pierce shall we and his lovely body and his lovely tats um <laughs> i did say tats not um anyway um <laughs> yeah no i think i think his performance in this is lovely i think it's really understated really simplistic and so vulnerable and exposed and that works so wonderfully when you realize he's he's kind of the villain. He's kind of the maker of his own demise. Um, and he's not actually that nice a guy. I mean, it's that thing of like, we're feeling sorry for him because of his predicament, because of his condition. But when when allowed to make choices, he's not really making the right and ones. when you see the flashbacks as well, like he doesn't, like the one flashback we see with him and his wife when she's alive, mm -hmm. I mean, there's two. One of them is when he's giving her too much insulin. <laughs> <laughs> and the other one is when he has a go at her for reading the same book. He's like, why are you reading that book again? again? She's like, I like this book, back off. Yeah, I think you do get the sense that it wasn't that happy a marriage. He says twice, my wife called me Lenny. I hated it. Like, oh, you hated the pet name your wife had for you, like that, and it, that's it. That you say nothing more. No, it's interesting because I've I've since read uh, Memento Mori, which is the short story it's based on, and there's more of that in it. There is more of a sense that <laughs> she didn't really like her, and yet, um, of course, you know the, the the incident surrounding it. She's raped and killed, and he wants to get vengeance. And you know, it's not to say he didn't love her, but there is a sense that you know it wasn't a particularly happy marriage, and he didn't really like her. And I I think. I think Guy brings all of that to Leonard. I mean, imagine having to play a character who has no memory, forgets everything every few minutes, has to decide whether he trusts other people, trusts himself, is trying to grieve the loss of his wife that technically in every scene he's just remembered. So you're playing a person who has a fresh grief every time they're they're aware again they develop a new awareness and they have to begin to deal with the grief process it move forward and carry out their mission i mean it's a lot it's a lot to play i also really like guy pierce's really almost calm and uh, almost monotoned voiceover even at moments where it's very heightened like yeah okay so what am i doing i'm, <laughs> I'm chasing, chasing this guy, guy. <laughs> oh no he's chasing me <laughs> yeah it's very chill and, and I think yeah that's and i like the humor as well yeah, i like that yeah. he brings that to it like i think a lot I, I, one of the criticisms i would have of some of nolan's other films is that uh they, they get so sort of lofty that there's not really a lot of room for a bit of a giggle and like to make jokes at this guy's expense throughout the film it's done well um and and he kind of makes them of himself as well i think which is really, teddy obviously brings a huge amount of humor so this is uh joe pantaleone who plays cypher in the matrix 
and excellent casting excellent casting you do and not trust him from the start nolan cast him for that reason because he he had just been a big b- villain and a big blockbuster and he's known for being a villain he's known for being untrustworthy so nolan has admitted he absolutely chose that guy on purpose so that we went so the semiotics of him of what we've seen before the audience goes in thinking i'm not sure if i can trust this guy the first thing we see is a polaroid that says don't believe his lies and then as it progresses, by, there's still actually chatter um, about whether or not he's telling the truth at the end. And I mean, he absolutely tells the truth. He tells Leonard the whole backstory. He tells him what's happened. He tells him he's, con- he's continuing to choose to try and find a guy he's already killed. And Leonard chooses not to believe him. And there were a lot of people who came away from the film going, oh, I still don't believe him. And I think that's mm. perfect. That's exactly the right casting then um, to have fooled us into not even being sure if we could believe. And I've already talked about Carrie Ann Moss. I mean, she is such a great femme fatale. She's wonderful as Natalie. She's so complex. And at the, a similar thing to Marianne Cotillard. I feel sorry for her. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, I'm very wary of her. And she plays that beautifully. What about the, uh, the cast of Tenet? Um, I think you've got a bit of a harder yeah so corner I'm just to fight for <laughs> because it's much more about the concepts than it is about well at least it's yeah. trying to tell you it's more about the concepts than it is about the characters and i'm probably not going to beat leonardo dicaprio but they let elizabeth debicki be tall so they let elizabeth yeah. but also she it deserves her song point oh she, she loves her song that is my one thing i really dislike about tenant is yeah. that she's being told that the world's gonna end including and everyone's gonna my die son. including my son yeah it's that's like, what we said yes surely it would be worse if he was the only one left it would also include your son glad we could get that <laughs> thanks for up. reminding us Cat. such a bad line <laughs> <laughs> but i would say apart from that i actually think she's a really interesting character and, and maybe one of the most uh, I, I guess i guess it's kind of that thing that she falls so out of line with the dead wife trope that she's kind of interesting in that way because it's like oh she's very different and and really the film emotionally centers around her because at the end of the day you can take away all the the world ending future battling pair stuff and you get this woman having a moment of like of of taking back control from an abusive husband i mean that's what it is at the very very end of the day and she gets told specifically you are the backstop like she gets told you your role is just to make sure this doesn't happen you have no agency here you are just a, you are here to stop something from happening yeah, rather she's than like, to no. do something yeah no 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 <laughs> i'm going to like i'm not going to let this dude like continue to have power over me and i just i think that's like pretty powerful for a film and it's not it's quite nuanced it's not thrust into the center of it but she is really the heart and soul of it uh, and I also just think, I think John David Washington is a just really great action star. And I so remember, charismatic. Well, yeah, when I remember when all the trailers came out and it was the tagline, um, like a, a new type of hero, a new kind of hero. Yeah. And time for a new protagonist. Time I think for a was. new protagonist. Time for a <laughs> for new, new protagonist. <laughs> 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 protagonist. <laughs> um, <laughs> but you're right that like, I loved that you were saying earlier about him not being this cynical, like, browbeat. That's the word dark. I was looking for. Cynical, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> because, like, yeah, he has he has faith in the mission and, and he has faith in this woman as well. I love that he's like, I'm not just going to let this woman be a pawn because she, she like, deserves to have her happy ending. And, and I, yeah, I love that he's charismatic. He has that great joke about, I ordered the hot sauce an hour ago. Which was improvised. And then he beats a man with a cheese grater. Oh, he does do so that. good! <laughs> yeah, points Such a good scene. <laughs> it's Christopher Nolan kind of taking this entire childhood's worth of Bond movies and going, I'm going to make myself something that's a little bit different. And, and I'm going to create, you know, I'm going to create, like, my own little version of Bond, of, of some Someone who's going to fit my view of the world which i think like christopher nolan does have quite an optimistic view of things what john david washington john john david washington does so brilliantly is play the whole thing with like a hint of deja vu mm. like the whole the first time you watch it it's like he's barely responding to some things but then when you watch it again you know in the opera scene there's like a bit when he's looking around and obviously it looks like he's just checking things out but also it feels a little bit like have i done this before you know i i have some issues with 
the Sator casting and also that relationship because I think we've gone from a woman being a dead wife to an abused wife and I would like to see a few more uh, female characters in Nolan's films that aren't just dead or abused. Um, although you mean in terms of like their the relationships, are, their, their characters are defined by the relationships they have with men? Yeah, massively. Mm. And I think often they are a catalyst for the male protagonist's mythic journey, which, look, it's fine. Like, you know, Nolan's writing what he knows. I, to date, have only written female protagonists because that's my experience. That's what I write. And I'm not asking him to necessarily step outside of his, you know, comfort zone that much. But I think in in films that are fully populated by full casts of people particularly with the likes of inception or, or tennis that i what the way i always say it is why can't a lady wear a suit like why can't she be one of the guys in the suits who's explaining the thing rather than being sort of some catalyst for for the and i know we do get that a little bit in tenet with priya and with the scientist who explains bit, how it then works they go um, too far with Priya being character. like you didn't think she was going to be a woman did you but hey mm. she's a lady <laughs> well i'm going to go in a, in a way that people might not expect i'm going to give memento full points because i think hazel did such a good job of arguing about guy pierce and carrie Ann moss and that's for um, victory dance i don't know, I don't know if <laughs> people on the podcast it's just a completely to silent don't get to dance. experience the joys of that alone in a and then i'm going to give uh, inception two uh, for the incredible ensemble, but also Leonardo DiCaprio's very grounded, emotional uh, uh, performance. And Tenet, even though I absolutely love it, relies less on its cast to get the job done. So I'm going to give it one point. Yeah, that's fair. I think that that's is fair, totally isn't it? Fair. That is fair. <laughs> so now we're going to go on to the third round, which is cultural impact. So how has this Nolan film changed the way that Nolan makes films or even films in general i mean inception certainly changed things in cinema you're right what you were mentioning earlier hazel memento has everything in it that nolan has ever explored just in a more compact way and tenet i mean if we're going to talk about future influence you know has it already happened and things like, i think tenet will change things again i think it has inception already did. not to ruin my argument spoil it, go. well i think the fact that last summer like the entirety of the future of the film industry was hanging off ten yes it was <laughs> in a way that did not happen to inception or memento mm -hmm. i mean yeah that's not in terms it's a lot of, of pressure of to creative. put on one film in it yeah i mean it was a bit crazy that everyone was sort of expecting that hey we're gonna use this one film as as a factor to determine whether we should be releasing anything for the next six to twelve months but <laughs> i think when it comes to like cultural impact in a wider sense of like what we will be talking about you know changing the landscape of film we will be returning to tenet because what happened last summer was like incredibly crucial for how we're going to be going ahead with the making of films the distributing of films the watching of films and the fact that it did very well at the box office you know Under considering what it was but it didn't meet expectations and like hasn't that just completely changed like the film world that we're living in today mm -hmm. i mean nothing's coming out because it <laughs> didn't make the money it was meant to i also think <laughs> that it's on a different note i think that he's made a very different movie knowing the landscape in which people receive films now so there's certain moments in a film like this where things run backwards and forwards where he doesn't show you the backwards version of something and i think he does that on purpose because he's like you're gonna do it no i think it does have an incredible rewatch value that people will keep coming yes, back to it, it and does. keep picking apart new things and the thing about it not making sense i think it does it, the more you watch it the more it's like i feel like i understand it now incredibly i feel like i know what's going on and i only watched it twice um but yeah i, I think I think it, it seems like I'm going to totally lose this round because it just came out. But having said that, I think we're, we're like standing on the precipice of it doing things. It is hard because I can't really argue for what has or hasn't happened yet. And I feel like the risks are always the ones that, that last the longest. I mean, if you look at the, the great famous films of film history, you know, stuff like Apocalypse Now and The Godfather, like people didn't know they were going to do well at the time. No one came out going like, this is going to be a piece of a cultural icon. We're releasing it now and get ready. Like this is going to become part of the canon. So I think it, 
I think the fact that it did have a little bit of a mixed reception is almost a good indication of what's going to happen to it in the future. Because it- I'm going to give Clarice a bonus point for trying her, for, for no for using the concept of time in her argument <laughs> what i'm saying is i went in the little turnstile and i'm actually from the future i came back to tell you that tenant becomes the greatest film of all time i knew it i knew it all right I mean, joe let's talk I, about inception I just, I just don't know about that like i feel you like really don't, you don't think so i mean maybe in the filmmaker critic world maybe but i feel like for just for the general public like Tenant's not going to be the Christopher Nolan movie that people continue to go back to. But I think it will be like a Blade Runner-esque thing where like it's such a huge impact on cinema, but you might not, it might not be everybody's, you know, go-to sci-fi film. Like Blade, you know, obviously Blade Runner is incredibly popular now, but it wasn't. I think that you're almost making the opposite argument though, because I think when you talk about a film like Apocalypse Now or Godfather that wasn't on anyone's radar or, or, or Blade Runner, I think that's kind of what we were dealing with with, with Memento. It was screened in the basement of Toronto Film Festival. No one gave a shit and it wasn't, it didn't even get a release until, I think it was actually Soderbergh pushed for it to have a US release the following year or something. Hell yeah, Soderbergh. Good lad. I did check the facts on that. But um, I think that's, that's the kind of movie that was the surprise hit, the surprise cult classic that ended up leading to that kind of twist and change in cinema. Whereas weirdly with Tenet, I feel it was the opposite. It was the big Chris Nolan blockbuster of the summer and everyone was expecting Well, I think it's because so it's much. not doing it the way that people expected it to do it. But sure. I think it's going to influence things in a way that people don't realise I don't even disagree. I, I think it will influence things to some degree in the same way that The Matrix did, specifically around cinematography. I think when everyone tried to replicate bullet time for the entire noughties and made a show of it, I think that's what we're going to get here with inversion and and playing about with the backwards mechanics of filmmaking. And that I think, I think definitely in terms of cinematography and score, I think Ludwig has done something new and really experimental and, and, and great there so that I think people are going to be pulling from that. But I don't know about it changing the landscape of, of cinema in a wider sense or changing sort of people's opinion. Like Inception, I'm fighting Bwah. someone else's fight here again. There's your cultural impact Bwah. on Inception. Yeah, <laughs> dream within a dream. It's kind of down to more Casino Royale, but since Nolan came in with Batman Begins, that sort mm-hmm. of grittier, more realistic take on movies into Inception, I think that, people have been trying to replicate that style of blockbuster filmmaking for the last 12 years. Yeah, I mean, even when it comes to like just trailers in general, like after the boom, every trailer had that, like every movie has that in there and they all try to replicate it. I just feel like um, Inception will be like the definitive Christopher Nolan movie for like everyone, like whether you're into films, not into films, you're just picking something up. Like Inception's it. And when it, when it's got someone like Leonardo DiCaprio in it and such a good cast, it's, it's just, it's easy to gravitate towards. Like it's just a great movie in general. And I feel like just Memento is like just a bit too early um, in, in, the, in these movies. And I think Tenant is just gonna be overshadowed by everything else. Like I, 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 I like Tenant, but I just don't think it's like, one of his best movies. Mm-hmm. Hazel, I mean, you, is your argument specifically that it influenced the rest of Christopher Nolan's career? Because I would say that I agree that that is potentially the most, has the most cultural impact in terms of his career. Yeah. But I would say that Inception changed cinema more than anything else. Yeah, it's, it's a tough sell. I mean, obviously we have the benefit of hindsight and what happens happens. Well, Clarice has um, got the benefit Unfortunately, Clarice apparently. is fighting against, it hasn't <laughs> happened yet, um, which is ironic. Um, but no, that isn't my entire argument, to be honest. I do think it was absolutely the launch pad for Nolan. I think it was um, the sort of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It was sort of the stomping grounds. It was sort of the Petri dish where all of his um, techniques got to be played with and explored and experimented before he was handed a massive budget to sort of play with them on a different level. And for that reason, absolutely, I think it was the place where Nolan launched from and and we would not have the rest of his films that we have now without Memento. So the huge cultural impact in in that It's also amazing that the guy who did Memento got to do Batman. 
I like, mean, insane. Yeah, I just that just would not have happened. I don't think we'd have had that Christian Bale, Dark Knight, uh, Heath Ledger, Joker. I mean, we maybe would have had some of the same cast, but I just don't think without Jonathan and Christopher Nolan, we'd have had that same universe, which has changed so much of certainly superhero storytelling, definitely DC. Um, so when you kind of look, I think what it is with Memento is looking at the knock-on effects and, and remembering it all goes back beautifully to this tiny seed of an idea i think you're totally right go on joe what were you gonna say i agree yeah just Thanks. give it a three point so. <laughs> yeah honestly I'm artist, yeah, I, I i i i'm i'm going to give inception top points oh, Mate, I'm, them, then. I'm going gave them to me listen <laughs> no. listen i'm gonna give you a bonus point for out arguing that so brilliantly to the point where joe wanted to give yeah. you the top it was, points. it was beautiful it was beautiful so you're getting two points and, and, and i'm gonna give carice uh, the, the low points but she's already got her what's happened's happened bonus point so both hazel and joe get three points for that and carice gets two points and the reason i'm doing that is because i just even though you've argued that so well I think that on a larger scale, and I know that the seed did come from Memento, but I think on a larger scale, and I know we wouldn't have had Inception if it wasn't for Memento, but Inception did, and it still is, has created such a shift in the way that, in the expectation of what a blockbuster film looks like. I think even you say that it's influenced DC, obviously it has because of Nolan's Batman, but I think the cinematography in Marvel films, like people will criticize it for sometimes for being a bit gray and a bit, you know, boring. But I think that's them trying to do that grounded version of what Nolan does in his films. Well, just because someone tried and failed doesn't mean it was his fault for being so wonderful. <laughs> Look, the, the thing is, I actually agree that Inception has had a bigger cultural <laughs> impact. But I was told here to come and debate my case. No, and but I, you're and I've right. <laughs> the seed, the seed of it does start with Memento. But I think that because Inception does exist and it did create more of a wave, I have to give the top points to that. But you get a bonus point, so essentially you get both get three points each. And at the moment, I hate to say it, but Tenet is is quite far behind with five it's points. Fine. I knew this was gonna happen. Of course you did, but I you know I mean I'm wearing the t shirt. You know, I I'm, came in here genuinely massive... thinking some bias bonus points were going to Tenet. I'm, I really we, did. I, I thought I was fighting an uphill battle here. I love Tenet so much, but I know that it is not it is the most divisive one and at the moment memento and inception are neck and neck with eight points each and the only thing we have left is the imdb round so my oh, my opinion my bias is now no longer at play although who knows what's going to happen i might just i might imp i might just go and <laughs> hack into imdb now <laughs> and give tenet the full 10 10 10 it mm. anyway um what do you guys think is going to be the general order of the movies, Joe, where do you think Inception is gonna is gonna land? Inception is gonna be number one, hundred uh, percent. I'm gonna go Inception, Momento, and then Tenet. I think you're prob I think you're probably, yeah, probably right with that. Anybody disagree? I, yeah, no, I'm ready to lose. I Let's think just, Memento just has just do it. Do it. Get it over Tomatoes, <laughs> but I I didn't look at the IMDb score, so I don't know. Okay, I think you're probably right, but there's only one way to find out. Um, Alexa. Tell me the IMDb rating for Tenet. Tenet has an IMDb rating of 7.5 out of 10. 7.5, very respectable, <laughs> but easily beat, I think. Like, I know I'm going to lose. We could just, we could just, I get it. Look, <laughs> I've accepted I feel this. Like we're this is hard for me too, Clarice. <laughs> Alexa, tell me the IMDb score for Memento. Memento has an IMDb rating of 8.4 out of 10. 8.4. You know what? For a 20 year old film, I'm happy. I'm happy with that. <laughs> I, Inception's got that in the bag, hasn't it? Yeah, but how close do you think it's going to be? 8.4 is pretty good. I but, don't, uh, I don't to know. Be, it's going to have to be around an 8.6 or 7 because you don't, it's, I don't think we've ever had like a 9. Yeah, I don't know. With it, IMDb oh. rarely 9s, 10s, mm. no. Alexa? So it's going to be close. Tell me the IMDb rating for Inception. Boing. The IMDb rating of Inception is 8.8 .8 out of 10. 8.8. .8. So close dance. to a 9. Do the victory dance. Do a victory dance, Joe. Uh, uh, no? Come on. Uh, uh, no. no. no? Sorry. Well, fair enough. Sorry, guys. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Just let everybody down, but that's fine. Uh, I'll, I'll just take the trophy. Yeah, I mean, you've got it at the end. Well in Inception leads with 11 points, but just behind it, Memento with 10, and 10 it with 6. Whatever, I get it. Look. It's fine. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm I'm just as upset as you are, if anything. And I and I'm going to begrudgingly give this this trophy to Inception, even though I obviously think it is. I think it is Nolan's. I best think we film. all came here agreeing that Inception is Nolan's best movie, but we had to fight the good fight. It is his <laughs> best film, I think. Um, yeah. That's anyway, right. right, trophy time. I was going to say I buy Clarissa Pint after this, but I can't. <laughs> Joe, well. I'm gonna I'm just gonna throw it to you. You ready? All right, cool. <laughs> Thank you. How do you feel? I feel like I've won this show in a dream, in a dream, in a dream. Thank Wonderful. you, guys. Oh my God, is the trophy still spinning? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Hazel Hayes, Thanks for joining for us for this, this episode. Has been so much fun. If that made you want to watch some Christopher Nolan movies, you're in luck because there's some great ones right now on Prime Video, including Inception, the winner, obviously, and Dunkirk. Do you think Inception deserved to win? What's your favourite Christopher Nolan movie? Do we not talk about your favourite Christopher Nolan movie? Let us know in the comments below. And we'll be joined next week by musician Dodie to talk about the best films about musicians. Not necessarily musicals, but they can be. Uh, and that's been inspired by Riz Ahmed's new film, The Sound of Metal, which is so good. Thanks for joining us. Bye, everybody. Goodbye. 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 Goodbye.